can't seem to get rid of him. I've been doing all I can to avoid him, but... I think he might be spying on me. Oh. Somehow the other day he replied to an email I didn't even send to him. Weird. And I keep seeing that thing. <gasps> Go about your normal business. What's that? I'm a bird. Tweet, ignore me. This has to be my second or third worst breakup. Oh! I am so glad that you are here, Lexus. Who was that? Uh, that was just my friend from the cell phone company. Is this is my phone number. Lots of people have the same phone number. That's not how phone numbers work. Oh, okay, Miss Graham Bell, Miss Phone Expert. You know what, this is your problem. You always focus on the minutia when you should be focusing on our future together. We have no future together. And I want you to leave me alone for good. And that means no more following me and no more spying on me. Spying on you? Spying? Yeah. Oh, that's rich. I would never spy on you. You know, this is exactly what you said when you were alone in your bathroom on January 17th, 6, 18 p.m. Ooh, what are you looking at? I was trying to turn it when you went that way. Now, we gotta coordinate this a little bit. These are my emails! Don't freak out. I'm just skating them for keywords. Keywords? Well, here's a list of them. That's an English dictionary. And I'm not even reading them, all right? I'm just analyzing the metadata. The what? Okay, think of it this way. It might be creepy if I went to your mailbox and I'd open up all your letters and I read them line by line. But it's not creepy. I simply collect information about those letters, the addresses, who sent it, when they sent it, how thick the envelope was, and then I use that information to be compiled so I can make conclusions about your beliefs and behaviors. Actually, that's super creepy. Oh, I checked the legal precedent for creepy. It's not. Why are you doing this? Protect you from terrorists. You're insane. All right, you might not think that you love me, but it's still my job to protect you. I'm like that man. No, that's that's silly. He doesn't have any superpowers. I'm more like Aquaman, but a land Aquaman. Instead of commanding fish, I command everybody. You don't command me. You're an arrogant jerk who screws up everything he touches. You talked me into racking up forty thousand dollars in student debt. You forced me into a healthcare plan I couldn't afford. You ruined my business. You spent all my money. We're done. And stop spying on me. Weirdo. Alexis, don't forget about me. Oh, I won't. I'll remember you every time I write a check to pay my student loans. Oh good, so you're still paying those. Turn the drone. <laughs> okay, so take a couple a uh, couple minutes here. I want your personal feelings. Like, are you okay with that? My information. I don't care if the government has it. I'm not a criminal. I'm not doing anything wrong. Have at it. You know, everything that Facebook knows about me, government, you can take it. Uh, it's worth it to keep me safe from the bad guys that might want to hurt the United States or hurt me or my family, right? That's the trade off I want you to think about. What are your personal feelings about that? Take a couple minutes on that one.
friends would walk up to me. Anybody want to share their work? Jay, you got something, all right? I feel like it is necessary uh, to an extent, right? So as me, right, I've traveled the country, so that's, we have to, <coughs> with our freedom, we have to realize that with freedom, it comes with our consequences. It's a consequence. So that's kind of what I want you to tease out, like, to what extent? Like, what are you personally comfortable with? I'm personally comfortable with, that's what I said, like, I'm, I'm getting to that. So, okay. Like, I'm pretty comfortable with them, like you know, kind of like going through like going through like my football phone records, my emails, they think that sort because it's all a matter of national security because they want to see if, if I'm a threat. Okay. If I'm a threat to the country, <clears throat> they like because you know when I because when I so I'm hearing if you're saying phone records and emails, you're an open book. Y'all yeah, open book because I mean my thing is like if you have something to hide, right? When everybody does have something to hide, right? <laughs> my thing is. If you have those type of if you have those types of things, then you might want to keep that off the grid to where can't nobody can nobody come to get those because that's the only way that the government can actually get it is if you put it on like your on like your okay yep computer. I got I got you so, yeah. anybody who want to take kind of opposite end that I, I you're not comfortable with them having full access I'm talking all text messages all email because I'm that's what I'm hearing Jay uh, say is that uh, that it's worth it. Um, that we can, uh, if the government's combing through every piece of information about every American, then they'll be able to weed out the bad Americans who are maybe having relations with, you know, other people that might hurt us. Is that, is that worth it? So, uh, so anybody else on the other side? I'm on the other side. Nobody's going to join me? Even a little bit? All right, Augie, what do you got? I feel like um, it's invasion of privacy for people to go through your own things without any reason for doing it. If they're just going through your stuff to go through it to make sure you're not doing anything wrong, um, I feel like as being an American, you shouldn't have to uh, prove your innocence. You're innocent until proven guilty. Okay, good. So, Sorry. Um, but yeah, until you give them a reason for them to go through your stuff, I don't think they should have their rights go through it. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I'm more on your side. So there's, and you're kind of giving a, a rights-based approach that uh, as an American, we have kind of those basic liberties we've talked about. Life, what's the next one? Liberty, Liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Now, here's where I think um, on paper it can look okay, Jay, for, for me. And I, I don't mean to be, there's lots of people who feel your way too, so I'm, I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to raise the issue. Um, uh, there, on paper it can look good but then if you start to think like what if there's something that's completely innocent but there's just a shred of maybe we should talk to him and all of a sudden you get a phone call from an FBI agent um, and, and what you did was completely innocent you know is that okay um, you know then all of a sudden it, you start to feel the intrusion rather than uh, having the idea on paper that Hey, if I'm not doing anything wrong, the government's not going to bother me, right? But in reality, you guys have watched plenty of uh, 
investigative shows and other things, right? Uh, there's human beings in the government and in the military and in other places. And so it's a process to uncover problems. And so by doing that, if they have access to your emails, um, they might find something else out about it. And then they ask questions and then something else is out of it. So I think it's kind of a slippery slope. Um, so I think a, it's kind of a, a rights-based uh, argument is, is good. I fear something that you guys probably don't even dream of either is that if the, um, if the government gets more and more, you've, you've heard of people getting screwed that are in jail? So if all of a sudden you did something that maybe was legal but not in favor with the current government regime, that they could do something to tamp you down in some way, shape, or form. Maybe it's not arrest you, but maybe make you a little uncomfortable, uh, put a little pressure on you. Have you heard of any governments doing that around the world? Which one? There's one that's really at the top of the list nowadays, but there's multiple, but it begins with a C. H-I-N-A, China. So China has a total social credit system. If you say anything contrary to what the government thinks that the, how the world should work, you get a knock on your door, you might even go to retraining camp of some sort, right? Uh, to show the ways of the government. Now, do I think we're gonna head the way of the Chinese government? Heck no, I mean, I'd like to think not, right? But I think it's always death by a thousand cuts is the way I always look at some of this stuff. If we don't stand up for our rights and some of the principles um, and, we're, and we're not at least aware that the, the real tra trade-off here, <clears throat> then slowly but surely, this cut doesn't matter, this cut doesn't matter, this cut just a little minor flesh wound, this cut doesn't matter, this cut doesn't matter. But death by a thousand cuts, if you have a thousand cuts, you eventually bleed to death, right? So it's always these little inching moves each time um, that can be detrimental. Um, so at the same time, I mean, we, we do have some, some uh, uh, national defense that's real good. It's, it's always just to what level. So it's not a matter of either or, like, I want complete privacy, I think this should, you know, go away or something. It's not like you're choosing one or the other. I think, Jay, you properly said it, to what extent, right? It's on kind of a spectrum. So I just want you guys to be mindful of that stuff as we're going through this course and, and macroeconomics as well. Um, that these, these uh, trade-offs aren't always easy to identify all the benefits and costs. Some of them might be a little more hidden um, and difficult to uh, unearth. Okay, uh, any last questions or comments there? All right, um, so we're almost wrapping up with our chapter 20. We got a few more things to go. So this was on, we left off, we kind of did a lot of big time stuff uh, last time with the elasticity business. And there's a few more elasticities to cover. So um, what we did yesterday that we spent so much time on was the price elasticity of demand. So this is what we spent all the time on. We, we calculated it. Um, I just said the elasticity of demand, so I'm kind of now adding on price elasticity. The price elasticity was the one relationship between quantity people want to purchase depending on the price. And goods then can be characterized in general as relatively elastic or relatively inelastic. So give me an example of a good with relatively inelastic demand. Inelastic demand, consumers are unresponsive to price changes for the most part. We went over a few yesterday. You could go with your gut feeling. So I guess maybe before we go with our gut feeling, which one, we just kind of got to have this memorized basically, which one's any, relatively inelastic, A or B? Which one's relatively inelastic? A or B? A. So as the demand curve gets steeper, remember my little cheat? It starts to look like an I for inelastic. So 
relatively inelastic or less elastic. We kind of you'll see that in the textbook either be more elastic or less elastic. So um, those were kind of the general concepts. So now give me a good that would be relatively more inelastic. The demand curve would look like that. Tobacco. Tobacco. Good. That was one of the ones up there. So anything. Tobacco, cocaine, heroin, uh, you know, get down on the list of drugs. Uh, the addicts are willing to pay for their addiction, right? So relatively inelastic demand for some of that stuff. Um, we also learned that we weren't too price sensitive for salt and bubble gum, right? If the price of salt goes up 20%, you're still going to buy about the same amount of salt. Okay. So that is uh, that. The, the couple cases we didn't get to was um, kind of the extreme elasticities. Extreme elasticities. And that would be perfectly inelastic and perfectly elastic. So a perfectly horizontal demand and a perfectly vertical demand. Okay, so what are these extremes? Well, if we take some price, uh, two prices here, call it P1 and P2, we increase the price and demand does not move at all, right? So Q1 equals Q2. This basically doesn't exist, but it's good to um, to kind of think about the endpoints to frame to frame ourselves here with, and so with this elasticity, the number we can kind of go back to our formula and calculate what that would be. And so we get the change in quantity as zero, right? Q1 minus Q2, remember what we did, uh, not yesterday, but Tuesday? Q1 minus Q2 uh, divided by the average. Well, all of that's going to equal zero because it's the same number. It's 10 minus 10, it's 20 minus 20, whatever. Divided by these two numbers, which will just be some number. And so what did we learn in math class? Probably in grade school about zero divided by some number. What does that equal? Zero. Zero divided by some number equals zero. So one of our extreme elasticities is if it's perfectly vertical, the elasticity is zero. Okay, well what about this one over here? So with this extreme elasticity, we've got some number here with the quantity, Q1 and Q2, but the price stays the same. So again, we go the elasticity of demand is the ratio of the percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in price. And we get some number divided by zero. And that's equal to zero too, right? It's got a zero down there, so that one's zero. What is that one equal to? I missed my mouth a little bit. What did our grade school teacher tell us about dividing by zero? It's always zero. Always zero. That's what Augie remembers. Augie, what grade did you get in grade school math? Probably a D. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. So can we divide by zero? No. no. So your, your grade school teacher might have said something like it's undefined or it's impossible or something. But now that you guys are in college, I'm going to uh, push your brains a little bit. So your fifth grade math teacher was correct. You can't divide by zero. But now that we're in college, let's divide by something really, really close to zero. Like how about 1 over 100 million? So instead of zero, what if it's 1 over 100 million? And then some of you I can see are squirming in your seats, so you don't think that's close enough to zero. So get a little closer. In fact, get as close as you want to zero. So how about 100 trillion? 
right? If that's not close enough to zero, one one tr hundred trillionth, get a little closer. All right, so you get as close to zero as you want, and then how do we solve this problem when we have a fraction in the denominator? What do you do when you have a fraction downstairs? What's that, Kaylin? I saw you doing the thing there. Flip it over and multiply it times the numerator. And if we do that, that means we've got 100 trillion, or as big as you want, times some number over 1. So it gets as big as you want to get it. It's infinity. You guys just did a little calculus, even if you've never had calculus class. You just did a little calc as this thing approaches, as this thing approaches zero, the whole equation blows up and it gets to as big as you want it to get. So we call that infinity. So here we got, and it's technically negative infinity. Remember, we still got the negative thing going on here. Um, but this is infinitely elastic. So we can call this one infinitely elastic. And this one, <coughs> He's got, we've got the elasticity equal to zero. Or perfectly inelastic. Perfectly inelastic. Okay, well this one turns out we're gonna use later in the course. That's why we kind of bring this up. Even though it, uh, it looks like kind of a far-fetched thing, it, it's not too far-fetched. Um, as we'll tell a story later, but this would be something that's perfectly elastic So people will at a certain price They'll buy as much as you want, but they're not paying more or less or in terms of what they're going to get Okay questions there All right um, We can do an elasticity for just darn near anything so we're just gonna look at a couple of them the income elasticity the income elasticity and I'm going to use the shorthand notation with a uh, my little Sigma script uh, Latin thing there and, and a subscript of an I for income elasticity instead of the price elasticity I've been putting a little D here for the price elasticity of demand the demand elasticity <clears throat> so this one we're going to be looking at income and it's another formula, but the formula is not too far off from what we had before. So it's still a number that shows the responsiveness of purchases, just like the other one did. But now we're going to look at how those purchases change when my income changes. So it's an income elasticity. <clears throat> Okay, so let's see. Um, for example, suppose the uh, income elasticity is equal to 2 and income in Ottawa increases 10%. What is the impact on sales of pizza? So this is the income elasticity for pizza. I was kind of making this up as I went. So the income elasticity for pizza is two. And the income in Ottawa rises 10%. This would be a good homework test problem that you'll see this weekend. <clears throat> what is the, or for our midterm, what is the impact on the sales of pizza? Anybody got it? So income goes up. What happens to sales of pizza? It goes up, Justice, by how much? 
that's the part we do with elasticities is instead of doing directions, we're going to quantify it. That's the whole reason we do these elasticities. So with this information and this formula, you can tell me how much it's going to go up by. How much? What will happen to the impact of sales? So I'm with you that it's going to increase, but by how much? Somebody shoot out an answer. It's got to be worth an extra credit point for this one. <clears throat> Take a step. Jensen. 20%. 20%. How'd you get that? Mm -hmm. oh, no. Two, times ten. Two times 10. Help me with this. Did you use this formula? Okay, taking a guess. Yeah, Caitlin? If our income went up 10%, the 10% is in the denominator. Two's on the left side of the equal sign. You multiply by 10 on both sides to get one. Very simple, right? So you guys, this is the same way we'd use the price elasticity, uh, that we can use these elasticities to solve what the changes would be. So it would increase 20%. And here's the Y. So the income elasticity is 2, and that's equal to the percentage change in sales, the quantity demanded, divided by the percentage change in income, which was 10%. And so now I'm just doing a little algebra here and bringing this over to the other side. Um, you know, I know you guys learn different ways, but multiplying this side by 10% gets rid of the 10, and then what you do to one side of the equation, you got to do the other side. And then if we flip it around here, the percentage change in quantity demanded equals 20%. Now, is it really a negative 20% like the price elasticity was? Remember, with this one, it always turned out to be a negative number. <clears throat> is that true here? <clears throat> no. All right, so what did we learn back in chapter three about how income can affect purchases? There was one of our demand shifters. What is pizza if the elasticity of demand is a positive two? Look back to way back to chapter three, it's in your demand shifter list. That's a good list to know for your midterm. So it's a good idea to flip back your notes. The demand shifter list has the answer to the question of what is this good? Does it always have to go positive? Does it always have to be positive or is it really a negative? You guys said no, you thought it was positive. What is in our demand shifter list? Let's, let's rattle off the demand shift. Oh, let me go here. Okay, Emily? Okay, good. Inferior normal. And so if an increase in income of 10% led to an increase in pizza sales of 20%, is pizza a normal good or an inferior good? So we had an increase in income of 10% and it led to an increase in pizza being purchased. Is that a normal good or an inferior good? It's a normal good? Normal good. All right, so now we've got a connection to elasticities and that whole normal good, inferior good. All right, so note, kind of key point here. Since the income elasticity is positive, so this is kind of a math way of saying that the number is positive, right? It's greater than zero. So this just means here it's a positive number, positive number. Since that is true, then pizza is a normal good. Pizza is a normal good. We talked about ramen noodles a few weeks ago. Those were our inferior goods. So 
So for ramen noodles, we'd end up having a negative sign. So if the elasticity, the income elasticity is less than zero, in other words, it's a negative number, then the good is an inferior good. So example, ramen noodles. And so with ramen noodles, maybe uh, an increase, an income increase, I'll just do it a little bit more formal here, so an increase in income of 10% leads to a decrease in quantity demanded of 20%. So the up arrow and the down arrow would mean a negative number, right? One would be pop, income goes up, purchases go down, income goes down. If we all start becoming more poor again, we start buying more ramen noodles, right? And so that would pop out a negative number and the good is an inferior good. All right, so one last one that if it's zero or close to zero, so let's just put note, if the income elasticity is zero or approximately zero, let me just, I'll just keep it nice and simple. We'll just put equal to zero, but it could be close to zero too. If the income elasticity is equal to zero, then the good is independent of income. What the heck does that mean? One of those goods tends to be milk. So let's look at you guys, your progression through life. I want you to tell you a life story here. So college, 20 something, making what, 10 to 20,000 a year, maybe if you got a part-time job. Gra college graduate, hit a good one. You decided to major in economics, so your starting pay was 50 grand. By the way, I do have uh, new graduates that get 50 grand worth of starting pay, so talk to me. Those of you who are starting to dig what we're doing in here. Come and be an economics major, good pay. One of the best majors in the business school to, to do, uh, for pay anyway. There's more in life than money, but I just thought I'd throw that out, okay? So uh, we get $50,000 of pay, and then 15 years down the road, you guys are 35, making $100,000 a year. How has your milk consumption changed? As you became richer, did you just start, you used to buy the half gallon, now you buy the gallon, and now that you're making 100,000 a year, you're buying two gallons. Or do you pretty much, if you're a cereal eater, you use a little bit of milk to eat cereal, and it doesn't matter if you're making 20,000 a year or $100,000 a year, you're not gonna eat, drink more milk, right? That's what we mean by this. So if the two are kind of independent of each other, it doesn't really matter um, what your income is. Uh, you're going to drink about the same amount of milk. Holding milk's price constant, by the way, that's kind of our ceteris paribus thing, is like, we're not going to say, well, what if milk was, you know, uh, $20 a gallon? Well, of course that would change. But ceteris paribus, holding the price of milk constant, and we're only allowing your income to change from $20,000 a year to $100,000 a year, you're going to probably drink about the same amount of milk, right? Okay, so that's kind of the income elasticity. Any questions there? All right, so we also have the elasticity of supply. Elasticity of supply. So the supply curve can be steep or flat as well. 
So conceptually, if we go to the board, we can do a really steep supply curve or a really flat supply curve, right? Same principle holds as the supply curve starts to become steeper, it starts to look like an I. So when it's steeper, it starts to look like an I, and this is the more inelastic. And the flatter it gets, it's relatively elastic. The formula for supply is the percentage change in the quantity supplied now. We're looking at businesses willing to supply their product at different prices. So we're using price in the downstairs and quantity supplied upstairs. And the rest of it just going uh, kind of falls into place just like the other the other elasticities. Okay. Um, that looks pretty good. I think that's a good spot to wrap up chapter 23. Uh, 23, sorry, 20. <laughs> yeah, that looks good. All right, so let's move on into the next content. So this week, um, we have another or a different uh, section called the special topics. I don't know if you guys looked ahead. So chapter 20 is the main chapter from the, uh, from the text, but we also have sprinkled into the course some what the uh, author called special topics. And um, this one is on... Um, External, uh, it's kind of externalities in the environment. So it's environmental issues and uh, something called the tragedy of commons. And so that's what we're going to uh, kind of briefly go over. It's not a very long chapter. It's mostly kind of reading comprehension. So um, I'm going to get into some of the issues. We're going to start with a short video. So on your paper, I want you to, to add on to your list there from this video. And I want you to think about what is the tragedy of the commons? So after we kind of watch this video, it's only three minutes and 20 seconds long, um, we're gonna be thinking about environmental resources. So if we go back to public goods, had two nons. Who remembers what that was from last week? Non-rival, good, and non excludable. So goods that were non-rival meant that multiple people can consume them at the same time. And goods that were non-excludable were ones that were hard to keep people out that didn't pay for them. And so common areas has that non-excludability problem. And so there tends to be the free riders. So free riders were people who were using up the good and not paying for it, right? And why are they able to do that? Because it's hard to exclude them from using it if they don't pay for it. So, you know, maybe some of you are guilty of this when you go into a, 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 a greenhouse or a, a nature park or something, and have you ever seen, how many of you have seen suggested donation, $3? How many people have seen something like that? Suggested donation, $3, $5, $10, whatever. Right, some sort of suggested donation. And do you all always pay the suggested donation? Or because it's suggested, you are suggesting that maybe I don't need to do that because everybody else seems to be just walking in, right? So that's kind of the free rider problem. They'd, they'd like to charge for it, but maybe it's difficult to do. And so that can lead to this tragedy of the commons. So we'll let the video play. So what I want you to do is Really uh, write down on your papers, you know, what is the tragedy that commons? So I'll give you a little bit of time after the video ends to do that. Oops, and I muted it, didn't I? I'd rather refer to this as the problem of open access resources. I'm going to back her up here. The tragedy that commons is a concern among biologists and social scientists alike. I'd rather refer to this as the problem of open access resources. In short, the tragedy of the commons occurs because each user receives direct benefit of using the resource, 
but only bears a fraction of the cost of its exploitation. So examples abound. I mean, it could be African elephants that are near extinction. It could be Amazon rainforest deforestation. It could be overfishing of many of the fisheries worldwide. It could be overfishing in the pond, say, right here. The idea behind this has been around for many years, but Garrett Hardin in his 1968 piece in Science was the first to bring this to the forefront about the time that the environmental movement began planning its first Earth Day. In Garrett Hardin's example, he presents us with an open access pasture. Anyone who wants to can bring their cow to graze. Each rancher's goal is to maximize his or her private benefit. Every rancher has the incentive to bring more and more cattle to the pasture because they receive the direct benefit of grazing their cattle there. Unfortunately, they only bear a fraction of the cost of the overexploited pasture, so they're going to continue to add cow after cow until the pasture is overgrazed and destroyed and no longer usable as pasture. In other words, their individual incentive invites overall room. For even though if they recognize that the pasture is being exploited, somebody else will bring a cow if they don't. And so they'll continue to do so. It's not that they don't know the assets being exploited, it's that if they wait and try to delay, it'll just be exploited by somebody else. The large issue here is there's a lack of excludability. The ranchers have no way of stopping others from adding cattle to the pasture. In his piece, Garrett Hardin suggested two main ways to go about solving the tragedy of the commons. The first is through privatization or private ownership. The second is through public ownership or government ownership. So whenever we have public ownership, I mean, one of the benefits is that we still all share collective rights to this asset. This is one of the reasons why we have the national park system, to protect uh, natural open space at Yosemite and the beauty of Yellowstone and things of that nature. But one of the problems with public ownership is that decision makers don't bear the cost of their actions, nor do they receive you know, additional value from any good decisions they make. For instance, imagine if you're a park ranger and you find some innovative way to you know, reduce large forest fires that adds value to the park itself. You don't receive the direct benefit of your decisions. You and your staff are not going to receive large pay raises or are not going to receive the large stream of value that comes from that decision. However, private ownership does solve this problem. With private ownerships, the decision maker bears the direct cost of their actions. And so for any poor decision, they're going to bear the cost of. But any positive, innovative decision, they'll receive the benefits. So if you were a ranger or a park owner who had found this innovative way to solve the problem with forest fires, then you would receive the stream of value from that good decision. There's not a silver bullet to the problem of open access resources. There's not a one-size-fits-all strategy. But we do know that limiting access and ensuring that decision makers bear the costs of their actions allows us to address key concerns with open access resource problems. Okay, so go ahead. What is the tragedy of the commons? So that's kind of what the title of the video was. So go ahead and give you a couple minutes here to describe what you learned in the video in terms of the tragedy of the commons. <clears throat>
Uh, Jay, you've got, you're on the extra credit board already, so number between, uh, let's go 6 and 13. 17. 6 and 13. Oh, my bad. I, <laughs> my bad. My bad. I'm thinking. Or should I automatically say 13 if you did something? Yeah. 10. 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We heard from you already. Kaylin. AJ, what do you got? Uh, I've been finished already. Well, Go off, off the top of your head then. Uh, tragedy of the Commons. What was it according to the video? What was the tragedy? What was the Commons? Whatever. However you want to answer it. Give me, give me something. Let's go. Can I get like five minutes? Okay. No. <laughs> this is part of college life. Bring it on. Uh, I only have red. Certain resources are what? Aren't reliable. Aren't reliable. Like what? You watch the video? Kind of. What are you talking about in there? What was the example? There was an animal I saw on there. What animal was that? You forgot. It's black and white. Has four legs. It was a cartoon animal. What was it? Cow. A cow, yes. So what was what happened with the cow? What does the cow eat? Grass. What was yeah, the cow was standing on grass, right? So you guys when we show these videos, this is what I do. You gotta be ready for it. You can do it, and you know what? It's okay. I dazed off in class too. But I'm going to try to give you every incentive to try to stay engaged a little bit more. So, sticking AJ, you know, you're not off the hook yet. So, we have the grass and we have the cows. And as they talked about the video, um, what happened to the land as they grazed? Oh, um, and you can even. Yeah, the grass turned black, right? So basically, the, uh, with the cow thing, uh, you had a whole bunch of cows starting to come on the land, and then eventually, you guys have seen cow pastures, right? They chew it up with their hooves, and there's nothing that's going to grow there. It's just going to be dirt, right? Because grass does have roots and all that to be able to come up, so you kind of got to maintain it. All right, so other people jump in here on the tragedy. I saw a few hands up. So what was the solution? What was missing or, you know, what's the part here that's, that's a little bit difficult to go? Dawson? Private ownership. Private ownership, right. So one of the things that was wrong, so they call it the tragedy of the commons because the land, and again, this is a little weird for, for Americans. Uh, I know not everybody in here, I don't think, I think we have a few international students, but even around the globe, we usually think in terms of private property, but back in the old days, they would have these open lands and anybody could use them, right? And so if anybody could use them, what's the price to the rancher? What's the price to the rancher of using the land? Zero in terms of their production cost of raising cattle to make a profit, right? So the price of that resource was effectively zero to them because nobody owned it. Now, what's interesting with property rights is that we can get the same result whether the rancher owns it, the person who wants to do the, the cattle, whether they own it or whether they don't own it. So what's interesting here is you don't have to own the land. What happens to ranchers when they don't own land? What do they do for their cattle? Jensen? They rent it, right? So now the market system in its marvelous way if beef prices are high and somebody owns some land over here that was normally in soybeans, they might say, gosh, I could make a lot more money renting my land out to the, to the rancher with beef prices where they're at compared to planting my ground in soybeans. In other words, there's an opportunity cost. But that opportunity cost comes about because of private ownership. And so it doesn't have to be that the rancher has to buy land to do their cattle ranching, they can rent it. But that doesn't happen if there's not an allocation of property rights that somebody actually owns that stuff. All right, so that was kind of the cattle example and then we might be able to uh, 
to find property rights and, and get an efficient result. Um, any other examples from the video that caught your attention? There was a there was a couple other ones that I wanted to f fish out. Kalen? Uh, I was talking about the pond I was overfishing. Okay, the pond overfishing, right? So I'm a fisherman, and I've actually been concerned about uh, this a little bit here um, since I bought my new Garmin Live Scope. I don't know if you guys is, is anybody fish? Does anybody know what a Garmin Live Scope is? Oh man, that's awesome. Have you ever fished with it? Well, let's just say it's using technology. Uh, so literally, the, the, uh, the Garmin LiveScope, actually, um, let me show you here, just so that we have a good example. So basically, it, uh, it, you guys have maybe heard that fishermen can use um, some equipment to locate where you know, groups of fish are. The Garmin LiveScope is a little unique in that you can actually see the fish moving. Has this got extra credit, uh, extra credit points that you're on your phone? No, this is one of those things like every once in a while. All right, so here is me on the lake. And see all these little specks? Those are all fish that are holding in between where this piece of structure is. And so as, I don't have a video of that, but I can actually see those little guys moving around and I can actually drop my fishing lure right in front of their face. But here's what I've learned from doing that. It just shows you how many fish you're not catching. <laughs> they don't always do that. They're either gonna do it or not. Uh, but does it help me locate the fish faster? Yes. Does it help me do some other things? Yes. So my point with all that is, if everybody has this new technology, which runs about $2,500 by the way, so not everybody has this new technology, just crazy addicts like me, um, then what's gonna to happen to fish populations? Start to go down, right? And so then we do have regulations on the quantities of fish you can catch, right? So maybe those will need to be adjusted at some time in the future. Um, so it's definitely been uh, a concern of mine with the tragedy of the commons and overfishing. And so then we bring in the government um, and the DNR, the Department of Natural Resources to try to figure out, you know, what is the sustainable catch? So it's not like we need to ban fishing. So let's kind of take a look at our stock flow problem with natural resources. Stock and flow of natural resources, which he also called open access resources. So maybe we'll put that on here, open access resources. And so over in the lake, I'm going to use my bucket theory here. There is only a certain amount of fish in the lake, right? So maybe some are going uh, this way and this way. All right, there's my little fishies in the lake. And so there's a hole in the bucket, and that's Russ with his Garmin live scope. And there's a certain amount of harvesting that goes on. And there could be natural death too, right, of some sort. So that happens once in a while in lakes. And then we have a flow each year. So that's a flow variable per year, how many fish are caught or harvested, right? And then we've got new fish coming in, and that would be the birth. Now that could be natural birth, or it could be augmented birth. So the Department of Natural Resources uh, also will um, get a bunch of fish together, raise them artificially in a tank, and then put them in the lake, right? So the birth could go, uh, could be augmented with technology again that way. So we've got the stock. So the whole idea here is that's the stock of fish. And so what happens to the stock of fish next year is a balance between the harvest and the birth, right? If more fish are harvested than what come into the tank, the fish level falls, fish populations fall. And if it's the reverse of that, then of course fish populations go. And so what we, what the DNR and, and other um, uh, biologists try to do is find the optimal harvest rate, right? So the key here with natural resources is what is the optimal harvest rate? to birth rate. 
that will maximize the population. So that can be done with biology and you know figuring out uh, taking samples. My good buddy that I played softball with for years, uh, he works for the DNR and he would talk about how they go and shock the lake. So they put these, the DNR goes in and, and basically it's like setting off a stick of dynamite, but it's a temporary shock and the fish all come up and they put them in a big net and then they count them, right? So that's how they get an idea of how much fish are actually in the lake. And then they do that every year so that they can monitor fish populations. And then that's how they decide if there's a limit of 20 crappie this year or should we bump it down to 15? Should we change the rates? And so um, over the years they've learned and so the rates at our Kansas lakes, they don't change every year. It's pretty much uh, the lakes that you go to, they have figured out what the optimal amount is. And so they enforce that through restrictions on the catch rate, on the number of cat. So one answer to that is restrictions on the number caught, the limits. Limits per species. So it's not just total fish either, so there's different types of fish out there. All right. Well, that tends to work pretty good for, um, for handling um, our local lakes and stuff. But it starts to get a little di more difficult with commercial fishing. So commercial fishing is a different, and another thing, uh, restriction on the number of cod, sometimes there's restrictions on the seasons was the other thing I was gonna say. Uh, restrictions on season for fishing. So that might be ways to handle. Works pretty good. Works pretty good for local lakes. What about ocean fishing? And this is really commercial ocean fishing. You guys watch some of those shows, The Deadliest Catch and The Biggest Tuna and all of that stuff, right? So out in the ocean, we've got kind of this more uh, larger access. And so the same problem has arisen over time that it tends to be overfished and all of a sudden some species you know, can't be caught or they're very difficult to catch. Um, so the answer to this one was a little bit difficult. They started doing some seasons but with commercial fishermen, if you shrink up the season, so let's say it used to be eight months and now they've made it four months. What the fishermen did, how would fishermen respond to that if they used to have eight months to harvest their fish to make money? Remember that this is a profit making business now, we're talking about commercial fishing. And now it's eight months. What could they do to change their ways to respond to the regulation instead of being eight months to four months? put more boats in the water, right? So that's one thing to do, put more boats in the water, put longer lines out, right? And then the other thing that evolved was the new technology with sonar and other things. So invest in more technology uh, to catch that. And so what we found, or what they found was that when they shortened the season, the commercial fishermen would all just pound the waters during that short season, and you'd still end up depleting the stock. So it wasn't quite as easy, and so one of the, uh, things here that was done was to assign a property right to fish. So they use individual transferable quotas. ITQs. An individual transferable quota is basically a right to catch a certain amount of fish. So this is a property right to catch 
a certain fraction of fish during a season. Pretty interesting that we could kind of identify a property right to fish. This is definitely one of the neat contributions that economists made that was really successful. And so to do this, this is also kind of called a, a cap and trade. That's a word that you might hear. So uh, cap and, I'll just put and, even though it's usually cap and trade, cap and trade. It's kind of similar to a cap and trade concept where the DNR is going to establish what the healthy total number of fish would be for a given year. So government determines the sustainable total catch for one year. So that's kind of step number one. Let me, let me change this into steps here. Step number one, the government determines the sustainable catch. Number two is that the existing fishermen and now it's called fishers to get rid of the man-woman distinction, by the way. So existing fishers um, get allocated an ITQ, an ITQ equal to some fraction. So for example, Let's say you've got 5%. Your company gets 5% of the total catch of that species. Let's say it's tuna or cod. Cod is where it really started off with. All right, so now it's kind of a restriction, right? So it's kind of saying, oh, well, you get certain amount, you get certain amount. It's almost like playing favorites. And so the economist is worried about whether the government is picking favorites, like, oh, you're just helping out your golf buddy who happens to fish, too, right? And possibly, maybe there'd be bribes underneath the table uh, to say that uh, we have a little cronyism that we talked about last time, crony capitalism, where uh, fishermen might be able to say, hey, government bureaucrat, government employee, uh, here's $1,000, how about you dish out another percent to us, right? So how does this you know, get allocated? Well. The initial allocation kind of stays fixed, and then what the economist would be worried about is how do we know that the best fishermen are out there? And that's where this transferable part comes in. Who would want to sell their permit? So if a fisher owns a 5% allocation, what type of fisher would want to sell that? So there's a marketable, transferable, in other words, you're perfectly fine to post that sucker on eBay or Craigslist, even though that's not where the real marketplace would be. But in theory, it's like, hey, ITQ for sale, highest bidder, who wants it? Who's gonna be selling it? What type of fisher is going to sell it? A sucky fisher or an excellent fisher? The sucky one, right? So the sucky fisherman, is looking at that thinking, gosh, I could make $10,000 selling this permit this year, right? Uh, and I don't even have to go out and fish. And I've only been catching like half of what I'm supposed to catch anyway. I hate this. I, I hate my life. So now this gives them a way out. But then who's going to be the highest bidder? The best fisherman who doesn't have a permit or another sucky fisherman? Who's going to be the highest bidder? Who's going to be willing to pay the most to our sucky fishermen? The best, an excellent, a Tom Brady, a goat, right? A goat that didn't have a right before says, I know I can pay $10,000 for that, and I'm going to go make $20,000 more, right? Because I'm going to fish the heck out of this in a short period of time, and I'm going to be moving on to other things. And so the transferability is what keeps 
good people out there and bad people away, and that's what the economist cares about. Is this system efficient? All right, so existing fishers get allocated some, and let's just put sucky, sucky fisher, sucky fishers can sell their ITQs to good fishers. And the key point then is that this makes the fishing industry economically efficient. Under the old system, we had too many fish being caught, right? So the fish are being depleted. We figure out a way to assign property rights to a good that seems kind of weird to assign property rights to. We assign property rights. Everybody who was a fisherman before gets them. But now there can be a reallocation through a market system, a market price of selling and buying these permits such that we get an economically efficient outcome where we wouldn't have otherwise gotten one by being creative in how we assign property rights. Okay, questions or comments there? All right, well mark your calendars. We'll have another exercise uh, tomorrow in class uh, because I'm gonna be in New Orleans. So I've got a conference to go to. So Nate is going to be, my graduate assistant is going to be subbing and there'll be another exercise for in class and uh, we'll be getting into finishing up this stuff and some other things. So, so turn in those papers, make sure your first name, last name's clearly on them. Just bring them up front here and start a little pile on this table and we'll, I'll see you on Monday, but otherwise we've got regular